All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's event, the Commonwealth Club. Uh, we're very, very excited this evening because I have the great honor and privilege of introducing my friend Fareed here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Mustafa Suleiman. I'm the CEO of uh, Microsoft AI. And uh, for tonight only, I am, in fact, your moderator. <laughs> Where do I start with Fareed? I mean, a phenomenal global public intellectual, a best-selling author, and uh, some of you may recognize him from a very small CNN show that he does every now and then. <laughs> Fareed's written a, a wonderful new book, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to you know, talk about it this evening and, and ask some questions. Um, so Fareed, where should we begin? Um, to kick things off, we're right here in the heart of Silicon Valley, and we spend most of our time here thinking about the future. Uh, and when we get stuck, we, we think about creating and inventing the future, solving problems today by imagining how things could be tomorrow. In your book, you've taken the approach of trying to understand how we got here, maybe where we're going, in the context of these grand revolutions. Tell us uh, why you started there. Sure. Let me first begin by, by saying thank you, Mustafa. You're, it, it is a huge pleasure and an honor to be doing this with you. Uh, not only have you done extraordinary things in, in the world of technology, but you have written what I believe is the uh, single best book on the future of art, artificial intelligence. But it's about much more than that. So even, even if you were not interested in the technology, it's really a, a, a extraordinary book. Um, so the reason I started to write uh, this book was about 10 years ago, I, I noticed that our politics seemed to be um, moving off kilter, kind of getting upended, by which I mean it, it was we were breaking familiar patterns. So first you had the Tea Party taking over the Republican Party. And there was a very good uh, study by a Yale scholar, Theda Scotchpaw, which pointed out she spent a lot of time with them that while they talked economics, their core concerns were all cultural. They were really upset about immigration, multiculturalism, what we would now call the woke agenda. Then I noticed as the United States was coming out of the Great Recession, 2008, by 2014, 15, it was absolutely clear the US had come out of it better than any other country in the world. Obama's approval ratings were absolutely flat, uh, were not moving. And what it suggested was a kind of break from a pattern that had been around ever since polling existed, which was the economy got better, people's sense of the economy got better, president's approval ratings rose, and that just wasn't happening. And so I began to think to myself, we were, we were living through something different. Uh, and I remember uh, reading a speech that Tony Blair gave where he said, we are moving from a politics of left versus right to open versus closed. Um, this is all that way back. And it made me think, you know, something big is happening, something revolutionary. Um, and I did have this feeling, you know, we were living through crazily transformational times. If you just think about the, this, what the digital economy has done, uh, what the rise of the information revolution has done to our conceptions of work and, and all that. If you think about the explosion of globalization over the last 30 or 40 years, much more uh, than anything anyone had ever seen before. I mean, you had take China and India just joining the world economy. That's two and a half billion people. Um, you know, in the 1950s, maybe Japan came online. That's 60 million people. Maybe South Korea, 30 or 40 million. Now, now two and a half billion. And I also f had a feeling that there was a lot of social change that we had not thought a lot about. And so you put it all together, and it felt this is this is big. So I asked myself, when in history have we had periods like this, where everything seems to get upended, where it does feel like there are these, this break from the past? And I found myself going back and starting in the 17th century with the Dutch, who really invent modern politics and economics. I know this, but th this is the part that everybody has a bit of a second take about the Dutch, really. Um, I said on Colbert that I was very high on the Dutch, which was, which was unintentionally hilarious. Um, 
but you go, you know, and that's an extraordinary story that I can tell. Then you go to the, the great failed revolution, the Fr French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, which is the mother of all revolutions. It really created the modern world. And then the second half of the book is about, okay, how does, how does everything we're doing now compare? And, um, and I tried to help people understand why we are going through what I call the greatest cultural reaction to change that I, that I have seen in human history. Because we've had probably more change in the last 30 years than we've had at any period in human history. So let's begin with some of the big concepts and maybe start with the basics. When you think about what is and isn't a revolution, how did you sort of frame the boundaries of the definition and really think conceptually about where it starts? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. There have been like 200 revolutions uh, or, or something like that. What I tried to do was to take, to, to, to try and do two things. One, I used the word revolution to describe a kind of fundamental transformation of a society, which then has deep social, economic, and political effects. So for that reason, and somewhat controversially, I argue that the American Revolution is not really a revolution in that sense. Why do I say that? Well, it was a war of independence. You certainly changed the structure of government at the top. But what people were asking for, the revolutionaries themselves, was a return to the rights of Englishmen that were enjoyed before George III usurped them. If you remember the Declaration of Independence, it's all about how bad King George has taken away all these rights that we used to have. The social structure did not change at all. In fact, in the South, the deeply feudal slave structure was kept entirely intact. In the North, the feudal structure was kept entirely intact. So while, of course, there are senses in which you could argue it's a, it's a revolution, the sense I was using it in this deep transformation of society, it, it didn't, didn't seem to fit. And the second piece was it had to have a kind of broad, almost global consequence. You know, So the Dutch Revolution is important because it creates the modern, the modern merchant republic. It creates modern economics, modern technology for the first time. And then it transfers that all to Britain, which becomes the, the, the superpower of the world. So it's hugely consequential. There are obviously others that I didn't. I mean, the obvious one I, I, should, I could have done was the Bolshevik Revolution. But it's really a replay of the French Revolution. In fact, Lenin talks about how he is literally trying to copy the French Revolution. And it has all the same characteristics. It largely fails because it is a top-down revolution imposed by political elites. So, you, you know, part of it was also, uh, I am a firm believer that books of ideas should be, you should be able to read them on one very long plane ride. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not giving you, this is not Shakespeare. I'm not, I'm trying to get across the most powerful ideas I have in an easily digestible fashion. <laughs> and when you look back at the revolutions that you did study, what would you say are the sort of overriding characteristics of those that last and those that, that fail? I mean, you, you sort of contrast the massive impact of the Industrial Revolution with the kind of failed uh, you know, French Revolution you know, quite starkly. And so I wonder if you draw out any sort of general lessons from those two that give us a sense for how things might turn out in the next few decades. So the revolutions that seem to endure and that transform societies and, and transform them, look, I'll be on a, you know, I, I, I'm not entirely analytic about this, transform societies for the better, are ones where you have this change that takes place from the bottom up. You know, you have e economics changing, technology changing societies, globalization spreading, and these changes are very deep, very structural. And they then change the social and political structures. And the social and political structures have to adapt to this, to this process. So in the Industrial Revolution, um, it completely transforms the world. There were, it was a world of agriculture. You know, I mean, most people don't, don't think about that. But 95, 98% of the people in, in the United States and Britain in, say, 1600 were in agriculture by, by I don't know, about 1850, you have a whole world of workers and craftsmen and tradesmen. You know, you've created an entirely different economy. Um, and for that to work, and then the politics has to change. It has to be enduring and come from, from the bottom. The French Revolution was really a case where it was, it was an effort to modernize society from the top down. France was not a particularly modern country. It was deeply agricultural, deeply feudal. 
but at the time of the French Revolution, Amsterdam was probably four times richer per capita than, than Paris. Um, it was not urban, uh, at, you know, Holland was by then almost 50 or I think about 50% urban. France was about 10% urban. So you see all these characteristics of sort of modernity, France lacked. But the political elites who, d who depose the king decide, we're going to put them in place. We're going to, you know, we're going to enact by fiat, liberty, equality. And it doesn't quite work. I mean, the French Revolution fails even on its own terms, right? This is a revolution begun to get rid of the French monarchy. How does it end? It ends with Napoleon crowning himself emperor. <laughs> right? So even on its own terms, it's failed. So when you think about the kind of characteristics of the bottom-up effects of the Industrial Revolution, like what, what, what are those? Let's kind of drill into those. What are those characteristics? The Industrial Revolution was fundamentally an energy revolution. Um, it, was, it was really an a revolution where, for the first time, human beings found a way to use inanimate energy to power their lives. Until then, the only way you could, you could do anything, move anything, get a machine to work, was to push or pull it yourself, or get a cow, a horse, a bull to push or pull it. Horses were the most, most commonly used for any kind of transport, which is why when the invention of steam engines takes place, you start to talk about them in terms of horsepower. Because by very soon after, a few decades after the, the invention of the steam engine, the engine that Watt has, has designed is able to, as I recall, uh, do the work of 1,300 horses. Um, and then you can go to Hyman Rickover, who calculated that a modern airplane does the work of something like 350,000 horses. <laughs> so so that, is, that is the fundamental nature of the, of the Industrial Revolution. And I, I, I think in doing that, you know, it completely transformed the world. It, 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 probably the single biggest application comes in the second Industrial Revolution, which is electricity. If you think about the, the, the importance of electricity and how it transforms societies. And I would argue that the information age, fundamentally unlocking the information, you know, creating a world of bits and bytes that controls the world of atoms is, is as big. We, we've never seen, there's nothing other than the Industrial Revolution, nothing, nothing quite as big. When, and historians have long debated over what is the fundamental driver of history. In, in some sense, in part of your characterization there, it's really invention that ultimately drives history. We, we create things and make things, and that shapes social structures. But then it's also social structures that go and shape history exactly. and people and culture back. Uh, this interplay, as it has you know, continually back and forth impacted how culture is shaped, how politics is shaped, how do you imagine, given the insights that you've kind of researched through the previous revolutions, how do you imagine that interplay plays out in the coming decades as we have all the new inventions that are on the horizon? Um, th that's a, gr a great question. So let me first just talk for a moment about that point you made, which is you're absolutely right that I see invention and innovation as being the key drivers of modern history. And the way you can tell this is you just take a graph of average income of human beings around the world. And we have good data, believe it or not, going back about 2,000 years. There's a wonderful historian named Angus Madison who's done this work. Um, for 1,700 years, it's a flat line. It just does not go up. And for everything we know, you know you've, we have been able to go back another 2,000 years who've been that. And then around the time of the Dutch, the rise of the Dutch, you start to see it go up. And then it go, it's a hockey stick. And you go from about a few hundred dollars per capita GDP to now, you know, we're at 72,000. But, but you know, for most countries, four or 5,000. The average, I think, is about 7,000 now. And what is that? It's that the Dutch figured out a few key innovations that transformed their situation. They learned how to use water and water management to tame the, the, the seas uh, and to reclaim land. That's why there's a wonderful phrase that the Dutch have. They say, God may have created the world, but the Dutch created the Netherlands. Because they reclaimed so much land that they felt it was really their, their act. They tall ships, which begin globalization along with compasses and navigation. 
financial innovations, the first joint stock company, the first multinational corporation, the Dutch East India Company, richest company in the world at the time, the first stock exchange, and all of that makes Holland, makes the Netherlands the richest country in the world by you know, 1670s or something like that. And then you get the backlash, which exactly as you, you're talking about. And you get people start to say in, in the Netherlands at the time, you know, this is, this is too much. We've changed our old ways. This is terrible. Uh, let's go back to the, the good old days. And there are politicians who tell you they're going to take you back and make Netherlands great again. <laughs> because it's all, you know, it's... A, um, well, and, and some of those backlashes become revolutions in their own right. Absolutely. I mean, the Iranian revolution, in a sense, is at 30, we're in 35 years of backlash to the Shah's modernization and, and dictatorship, you know, as a combination of the two. Um, the, the, the most, you know, so what, when you look at what's going on now, what you're struck by is the degree to which um, I think that people have fundamentally misread this as being all about economics, because the truth of the matter is, the data su suggests that most people have actually done better over the last 30 or 40 years, particularly when once you put into, uh, take into account two important things. One is the dramatic changes in standards of living, decline of costs, for example, of technology, food, clothing. And the second is the degree to which you have been able to get government redistribution in the, in the Western world. So you know, once you take into account income after all government redistribution is taken into account. That, that picture of middle class stagnation is not entirely true. More, most importantly, there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of people all over the world who have had dramatic rises in their incomes. But everywhere there is this deep cultural unease about what the world we're going into. And you can, you can tap into it, and you can, you can take advantage of it. And there are populists who've done it everywhere. So it's not, again, just the, the, the Western world. Modi in India, even though he's a great modernizer, plays on this sense of you know, against the cultural cosmopolitanism. Erdogan in, in, in Turkey has played the same, uh, with the same thing. To a large extent, Xi Jinping in China is, a, is taking advantage of the sense that things have gotten too crazy, too chaotic. We need to you know, go back. He has people singing Mao songs. Why? Because there is a yearning for some kind of return to a past. Um, and you ask the question, well, how, you know, what's the, what is the best way to navigate it? Look, the thing that what I was struck by in, in, in doing the research that there are two great dangers. One is of a, of a, of a right-wing reactionary uh, um, counter-revolution, which can be very deep and undermine the entire structure of, of uh, what has been in place. But there is also the danger of a left-wing, overly zealous, uh, you know, kind of French Revolution-style desire to get to push as far as you can, as fast as you can, um, and to do it all by decree because God knows virtue is on your side. You know, that is what the Jacobins did. And it doesn't work out very well because societies cannot digest that much change. They cannot take that pace of change. And what you end up doing is you lose the, you lose the, the society. And I do think there is a danger in the United States that, that people on the left sometimes don't think about that. Um, the degree to which, um, you know, Pushing these things, but particularly pushing them on a, on a population that is somewhat less, you know, comfortable with that much change that fast. And to give you a simple example, immigration. We're both immigrants. Um, we both obviously, I, I mean, the, the, the big story about immigration, the, the rational story, is the United States needs more. Because we are, you know, we are one of our greatest strengths compared to other countries around the world uh, is that alone among rich countries, we are not in demographic doom. Um, if you look at every other rich country, uh, they basically look like Florida. I don't mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't mean aesthetically, by the way. The Italians would be horrified at that prospect. Um, I, mean, I mean demographically. Um, the United States, on the other hand, takes one million legal immigrants every year, which is more than the entire OECD put together. But we have, there has been a lot of change in this country. In 1975, 4% of Americans were foreign born. Today, 15% of Americans are foreign born. In Sweden, that number is something goes something like from 2.5% to 22%. 
Sweden has more foreign-born people than the, than the United States, by the way. So does Canada, by the way. Um, and I think so, so, so what I'm trying to say is there is some reality to some of the discomfort people feel. And therefore, it makes sense to try to do it in a somewhat orderly fashion, first of all, entirely legally, and not, not accept a situation where there's a kind of any, anything goes situa situation at the border. But also to recognize that people do have concerns about assimilation and such. My view, they will all be overcome. You know, as the, as the parent of, of three kids, uh, you know, I can tell you the biggest challenge when you're raising, you know, an immigrant is raising his children is not how are you going to get them to assimilate to America? Is how can you hold on to a little sliver of the old country? <laughs> you know, is there like some little thing that they're going to, they get, they get Americanized so fast that it's breathtaking. I mean, that's something this country does uh, unconsciously so well. But, but people don't, you know, they, they see somebody who's different and sounds different and worships different gods and they get scared. And you know, don't always treat that as racist. That that is somebody's fear of their world going away. Yeah, I feel, I feel like this is a recurrent theme in the book. You talk about moving beyond the kind of left-right polarization characterization, which is a bit reductive and doesn't really kind of capture the way the world currently works. And you use this frame kind of over and over about open versus closed. Now, as we think about whether we're accelerating too fast or we're regressing too too quickly. How do you think about the lessons for striking that balance correctly? Because the, the frame sounds correct. I'm sure it will yeah. resonate with everybody. And, but just finding a mechanism by which we can measure the right tempo and make sure that it isn't leaving people behind or moving, moving ahead yeah. too fast seems like the, the key, you know, key to wisdom in today's age. Um, it's, it's the question. And I, I, I don't think I have you know, a, a better answer than to say, do it very thoughtfully and cautiously and, and you know, be aware of how much reaction, how much change uh, you are producing and, the, and, and the, the, the degree to which it's disorienting for people. Uh, give you probably the most important change that's taken place in our lifetimes outside of technology. It's the role of women, right? Every society in human history, going back thousands and thousands of years, some group is on top, some group is at the bottom. Um, you know, and there it's caste, class, social, some tribe is up, some tribe is down. But in all of them, women were second class citizens. In almost every society in, in human history, women have been the property of men until a few hundred years ago, right? And basically in the last 40 years, I would say that finally changed, and thank God for it. But, re but think about what an enormous transformation that is, right? And you're taking something that was the basic unit of society, the family, and changing the dynamic, the power structure within that, within that unit. That's big change. And so it is going to produce a backlash. And I would argue that if you look at the religious fundamentalism around the world, from Islamic fundamentalism to Christian fundamentalism to the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, they all seem animated by this one great desire, which is to put women back in the kitchen. Xi Jinping gave a speech recently in which he, was, he said, women need to return to their traditional roles. They need to have more babies. Uh, you know. So again, he's playing this role of capturing that unease. I think the one thing I would say is, you know, more, more concretely is, we've spent a lot of time trying to get the economics right. And I think that's very important. And I don't want to discount it at all. But I, I will point out to you that look at Northern Europe, which really has done an enormous amount in terms of redistribution, in terms of you know, social safety nets, in terms of uh, welfare st uh, uh, states and worker retraining and looking after workers and not hollowing out uh, the middle class. They still have right-wing populism. They, I mean, Sweden's second largest party now is a party that derives directly from the, from the, the fascists of the 1930s, the Dutch have Gert Wilders as the probably next prime minister. This is a, you know, probably on the furthest right of right-wing populism. If France were to hold an election today, the polls tell us that Le Pen would win. Uh, and that is, again, a party that draws fairly openly from a, from a fascist past. So 
there's some, you know, don't, don't downplay the cultural real, uh, real, uh, reaction here because that seems to be at the heart of it. You can play, by the way, in social, I always try to do this in social science, you try to vary the, the variable. So one more confirmation of this is, what is the one rich country in the world that doesn't have right-wing populism, where the same establishment continues to rule, uh, you know, pretty much uh, un undeterred? It's Japan. Now, Japan has every problem that every advanced uh, industrial society has, except one. They don't take in immigrants. <laughs> And so they have no reaction to immigrants because they basically don't take them in the first place. And by the way, the second point I'd make is women's roles in Japan remain very traditional while there has been some progress. So if you think about those as two key drivers of cultural reaction, it's interesting to note that the one country, the one rich country that has not moved very far, far in that area has the same LDP party that has been ruling now for 75 years. Talking about immigrants, there's a great quote um, early on in your book where you say um, of President Trump, um, his primary message is, the Chinese are taking away your factories, the Mexicans are taking away your jobs, the Muslims are trying to kill you, I will beat them all up and make America great again. <laughs> now, that sounds very much like a revolutionary slogan. Um, is he a revolutionary? You know, it's a, it's a very good question because um, I talk about how you have this odd thing that takes place where a number of the revolutionaries or the people who proclaim themselves as revolutionaries are actually trying to take you back right. to some. So he's a revolutionary who says, my goal is to take you back to the 1950s. When, before you had all these uppity women and all you're seeing all these brown faces, black faces in, in, in these rooms, right? So there's, there's something fast, and, and that is actually a pattern, that a lot of people who think of themselves as revolutionaries are actually reactionaries, because at some level, a counter-revolution is a revolution itself. Steve Bannon often talks about how he admires Lenin. Now, the reason is, you know, again, Lenin's goal was to destroy, was to break the system. Bannon's goal is also to destroy, to break the system. I suppose the change is, the difference is, what are you then trying to put in its place? And is that a movement, you know, that's why I say you can't be just entirely analytic here. Is that actually a movement forward or is it a movement backward? It's movement for sure. There are some great questions here asking about lots of other countries that may or may not be undergoing uh, revolution at, um, at the moment. Um, one comes from uh, uh, someone in the audience who says, I just returned from my fourth trip to the Ukraine, um, and I don't see a solution or an end point anytime soon. Um, what bearing does this have on the question of revolution in this context? Um, it, it actually, I think, is v it's very pertinent, because one of the things we in the Western liberal world, uh, it, we don't quite know how to celebrate liberal democracy, you know, because the essence of liberal democracy is it says to you, um, you know how the church used to tell you what, what the meaning of life was and what a good life was and how, you know, the communists told you that and, and, the, and the Nazis told you that? We in liberal democracy say, that is your private affair. You pursue whatever you think is your version of happiness, the pursuit of happiness, but the private pursuit of happiness. Um, and that's very unsatisfying, you know, because at some level, people want that sense of being part of a larger project. project. And that, I think, is one of, one of the things, one of the challenges of liberal democracy. Um, how do you fill that, em that, that sense of, of emptiness inside, you know, that religion and faith and nationalism and communism used to fill these, you know, think about all the great art and cathedrals that have been built in the world to an idea of God. Well, you know, it's not the same, but I think that sometimes you can, you can see the extraordinary achievement and power of liberal democracy by looking at those who don't have it and how ardently they want it, you know, and how they will die for it. I mean, Ukraine and Poland are, to my mind, very interesting countries. 1990, 1991, when the Soviet Union collapses, Ukraine and Poland have the same per capita GDP. Poland goes west, becomes a member of the European Union, becomes a member of NATO, uh, reforms its economy, reforms its politics. Ukraine is not able to do that. It, it wants to do that, but the Russian pressure is so strong that it essentially stays 
part of the Russian sphere. Today, Poland's per capita income is four and a half times that of Ukraine. They started in the same place in 1990. And it's not just about money. It's, about the f it's what it has meant for Poland to join the West and to become a liberal democracy anchored in, in the West, and for Ukraine to be stuck in, in this no man's land it is, and see how hard they are fighting to be part of the West. See how hard they are fighting to be liberal democracies. I mean, the, the, the battlefield losses, the Ukrainians don't reveal them because they are, they are horrendous. They are losing tens and tens of thousands of people. But I have been to Ukraine several times since the war began. And I, from my reading of the situation is their morale is undeterred. I mean, they, they, will, they will fight until the end because they do not want to be a Russian colony they want to be free. And you know, we, should, we should learn something from that. Um, now, the specifics of what happens, my own view, which is, which is obviously not, not one a Ukrainian politician can say, the goal of Ukraine should be to be part of the West, whether it does it with 86% of its territory or 94% of its territory seems to me a less important uh, goal. The goal of being anchored in the West in some sense, part of the economic and security structures of the West, that should be the goal. And I wouldn't get, I wouldn't myself get too caught up. Now, it's easy for me to say I haven't had my soldiers dying for those, for that, for those hundreds of yards. But that, looking at it from where I said that would be the goal. I mean, I guess this sort of speaks to another theme that is throughout the book, which is really trying to focus on lessons for how we bring about um, a moderatism. Like, how do, we how do we negotiate and compromise? How do we give in? Where do we find that balance? And, you know, it seems that whether it's 95% or 86%, fundamentally, this is going to become a question around territory and concessions so that we can either unify one side or reunify. And of course, on the Putin side, I mean, his narrative is very much around reclaiming and reunifying uh, in order to kind of reconcile the historical narrative around his interpretation of it. So how, how do you think about striking that balance? And how do you think we collectively help to generate narratives among ourselves that drive compromise and, and forgiveness rather than divisiveness? You know, I think one of the challenges, that if we do, one of the signs of being in this age of cultural reaction is it's very hard for people to understand how to compromise. You know, the earlier left-right division was largely based on economics. Um, it was, you know, you could tell how somebody would vote based on how much money they made and what kind of job they had. If you were blue collar and you made less than the median income, generally speaking, you voted left. And if you were the other way around, you voted right. And that was true in Europe. That was true in the United States. Um, when we have had this rise of cultural politics, it's much more complicated. Uh, people's, you, you can predict people's polling behavior based on where they stand on what I call the three Gs, God, guns, and gays. You know, and that's a much better predictor than, uh, than, than economics. But here's the challenge. Those, you know, you could always compromise on economics. You want to spend $100 billion, I want to spend nothing. Well, there's a number between those two. You want to cut taxes by 20%, I want to cut them not at all, but there's a number between those, right? How do you compromise on what seems like core issues that are deeply about your, you know, your values, about, about gay rights, about abortion, about, you know, so many of these issues feel like they're binary, and that's what... I think makes them hard. But the truth is, you know, living in complex societies, we do have to understand, you do have to compromise. You know, Europe approached abortion, for example, in a, in a very different way than we did. We had the, a court ruling, which essentially took it out of the realm of politics, made it a constitutional right, and it produced a 35-year massive right-wing mobilization and reaction that elected Ronald Reagan and, you know, all of that. The Europeans muddled through and found a compromise around 14, 15 weeks in most European societies. And they have had none of that poisonous politics because they kind of worked it through the system. You know, it wasn't a case where it was decreed from on high, then people felt that they, you know, they, they, had, they had no voice in the process. It's a, tough, it's a tough conversation, particularly for liberals to have, because I understand how, and how insulting it is, particularly women, to, to say that this is going to be decided you know, in that way. 
but from a society's political health. The more you can have these issues talked about, discussed, debated within a political context, I think it gives them greater legitimacy because they, you know, there is a sense that we went through this process and we found a place where we could get to. And none of these, no, no European country has had that backlash to Roe that we had for 40 years, which you know, probably elected thousands and thousands of very right-wing politicians who then appointed all these right-wing judges who, by the way, have been right-wing on a whole bunch of other stuff entirely outside of abortion. So there's been a, a huge legacy beyond it. It's super interesting. Three of the questions here are really about the same theme, which is unification in the US. How do we take practical steps towards compromise, forgiveness, and unification. I mean, on this very question of abortion, I mean, obviously, in the in the upcoming um, election, President Trump, of course, I'm sure will make, uh, you know, a, a big song and dance about this. I mean, what, what would you say are the kind of practical steps that people can start to take to demonstrate compromise and demonstrate, um, you know, uh, some kind of middle ground that is hopefully going to unify the country? So, by the way, Trump, who is who is a shrewd character. I mean, don't 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 don't. He's a, he was a bad businessman, but he's a good salesman. And like a good, like any good salesman, he understands you know where people are. So on abortion, he has very much moved away from the the you know the kind of right wing extreme view, which is that you want to have a federal ban, total ban. He's more in the 14, 15 week, and he's trying to say let the states decide. And if some states want to be more liberal, that's. You know, that's because he can see that this is a losing position for the for the Republicans. And and Trump, of course, is completely opportunistic. He could, you know, he, he for more entire his entire life was pro-choice. And so he's trying to find a place to go. I, I think that, you, you know, the challenge here, I'll be honest, it's it's it isn't, you know, the, the, we, we have to face the elephant in the room, which is that the Republican Party has gone berserk and. <laughs> Um, and you can't, you know, and, and I say this because I'll tell you what I think has happened. And this is what makes it so hard. For in the, in the 1960s and 70s, you got the rise of a kind of Republican politics that was fundamentally arguing that everything that, that had happened in America for the, since the New Deal was a terrible uh, deviation from American's norms. So they were promising and this is Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan and, and then Newt Gingrich, they were promising stuff like, we're gonna get rid of Social Security and Medicare and the welfare state. And you know, r right down to Ted Cruz's last campaign, which we forget, he was, he was campaigning on abolishing the IRS. <laughs> now the problem with all these positions is they're nuts and nobody's ever going to implement them, right? And, and they're, and they're, and they're no, never going to get implemented because all these the, these things are very popular. And by the way, you couldn't run a modern society without them. So what has happened is within the Republican Party, there is a narrative of betrayal that if only our elites, if only our leaders hadn't lied to us. And so it has become this. This is what produced the Newt Gingrich revolution. This is what produced the Tea Party, the sense that we were betrayed by our own and we have to destroy the Republican Party. So the apotheosis of that is Donald Trump, of course, who's fundamentally not a Republican. I mean, the 2020 Republican National Convention, the Republican Party had no platform for the first time in its history. The platform was one paragraph that said, whatever Donald Trump says is the, is the, is, is the Republican Party platform. It did not invite a single Republican president, former president, a single past Republican presidential nominee but there were, in prime time, five speaking slots saved for the Trump family. Um, so I mean, this is, you know, this is not a, there's something kind of bizarre that has happened to the Republican Party. And normally when you lose an election, you know, there's a market that works. You kind of, you try to change the policies that, that lost you the election. But if you think about the Republican Party over the last, you know, 20 years, they have only won the popular vote one time in the last 24 years, 2004, Bush. Bush v. Gore, he lost the popular vote. Trump lost the popular vote. And, and, and of course, all the other ones when a Democrat won. So you'd think there would be an, an effort to adjust policy and be more inclusive and all that. 
But because of two things, one of this, this air of, you know, it must be because we're not sufficiently right wing, we actually need to argue for eliminating the entire federal government, you know, which is the Vivek Ramaswamy view. Um, <laughs> And, and that's still, you know, that's still a currency that like our mistake is actually we've been too moderate. And then the second piece is the electoral college, which means you don't actually face the brunt. You know, I mean, they, they, there's something weird about the electoral college where it, it doesn't make you realize you're losing, that your positions are unpopular. You know, people ask me what's going to happen in 24. Obviously, I don't know. But what I think I can confidently predict is Joe Biden will win the popular vote by at least eight million votes. Right, which is a funny thing to think about. Like you, you know he's going to win, but which in any other country would mean the outcome is preordained. But of course, not in ours because we have this bizarre system. So, in order to get a, a more healthy political dynamic going, I do think you need the Republican Party to understand that you know these things are not popular. It is now, for example, holding up all this legislation because it is trying to govern as if it is the, you know, it has a two-third majority in the House of Representatives, when actually it has a two-seat majority in the House of Representatives. Like, that's the, it, it sort of, you know, the, the, when you have a two-seat majority, you have to compromise. I mean, do, do you think this has to do with the extent to which there's an anger and an anxiety that is driving one side more than another? Because often it's it's really that temperament rather than the, actual number of people in a majority or minority which drives some of the actions. I mean, take, for example, on abortion. I think that you're right. It, it sort of shaped four decades of the political landscape. And if you consider today like where anger and anxiety lies on both sides of the political spectrum, how do you think about how that's going to play into the next election? Yeah, that's a very good point. I should have made it more clearly in the book. You put it very well. It's the intensity of feeling often that is more important than the aggregate numbers on one side or the other. And look, if you think about it in terms of this open-closed divide, you, we're basically in a world where there's an enormous amount of open information system, open trade, open, uh, you know, if you think of diversity and multiculturalism as part of that, that open side. There are a lot of people for whom this is, this is deeply unnerving. And it feels like their world is disappearing and their place in that world is disappearing. And they feel this much more intensely than, than the other side, which feels like, yeah, this is complicated, but we'll be all right. We'll muddle through, right? That, that sense of we'll muddle through is very different from, oh, my God, my country is disappearing. My culture is disappearing. And if I don't do something to save it, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be finished. And I do think that that intensity of feeling uh, animates a lot of the of this reaction you know i've been i i i have been looking and i use some of it in the book at the research about the secularization of america which i think is a very big piece of this i think again we tend not to realize what a central role religion plays in in many people's lives in america and until very recently america was the great outlier among rich countries in that it was still very religious from 2007, America has become dramatically more secular. So the number of people who say they have no, you know, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S, um, <laughs> uh, has dramatically gone up, roughly speaking in 30 years, from zero to 30% now. Uh, the number of people who say they go to church. By one uh, count, the United States is today the 12th least religious country in the world, or at least of the 50 that were surveyed in that survey. Um, so it's, it's very dramatic what has changed in, in, in America. And again, just think about for those people who look at this not with, you know, kind of a sense of, oh, this is the way of the world, but a sense of, oh, my God, my world is going away. That must be deeply unnerving. Well, and, and fundamentally, this is f first and foremost about culture and the backlash, but also about economics. And one of the things I sort of worry about over the next few decades is that you know, as, as automation spreads and the benefits of, you know, technology really drive and proliferate, it's also going to destabilize the way that people work today. It's going to destabilize people's livelihoods and identities that come with that. And there's going to be a huge market pull for those kinds of productivity improvements, which, you know, on the face of it are in aggregate going to be good, but are, you know, at an individual level going to cause significant instability and disruption as people have to retrain and adapt. 
How do, you, how do you think about how we manage that revolution over the next couple of decades as, you, as we look forward and think about you know, just the impact on yeah. taxation and redistribution? It seems like this is going to be a fundamental driver of, 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 of the backlash. Yeah, and you, you talk about this uh, it's in a super smart way in your book. I, look, I, and I think it centers now around AI. I, I, I do think for the next few years, you may, you may prove me wrong, but for the next few years, I think we're still in the phase of trying to figure out how AI transforms things. You know, right now we're still mostly in a kind of text-to-text -text world of AI, by which I mean I ask ChatGPT or Bard or uh, Gemini a, 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 a question, it answers me back something I'm dazzled by, oh, it's able to you know, write the answer in the style of you know, E. Cummings or whatever, <laughs> right? But the real ch transformation is when you go from text to action, when you tell the AI to do something and it then interacts with some piece of software that then interacts with some piece of hardware, and it actually changes things on the ground. That, I think we're still a, a bit of a way from, and we're trying to figure it out and sort it out. But when that happens, I think it's going to be, the, the, the transformation is going to be dramatic. And the number, I think there's no other way to think about it, but the number of people you'll need to run those things will go down. The number of programmers, by the way, you'll need will go down. The number of people you need to move the atoms around will go around. And you end up with a, a new kind of, you know, a new kind of techno elite who are not just, it's, you know, it's, 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 we thought we had a techno elite, but now it's the elite of the elite. It's the people within, you know, if you think about a, a, a programming unit where you say, okay, we can produce the same amount of code, but we need to use the top 30% of the programmers. Uh, and we don't quite need the, you know, and, and, and again, I think there'll be jobs and things like that at that level, certainly. But, there, you know, there will be less fancy jobs and less high paying jobs. I worry that we have that happening at the same time that we are also going to be having a, a, a something which increasingly will be that as the AI gets better and better, we won't understand the answers it's providing. We won't understand why. It's doing what it's doing. And I think that, in some ways, might be even more unnerving. That you have, you know, you, you, you have to do these things, and you don't know why. It's because the machine is telling you, the black box is telling you. And, and the truth is, most AI uh, researchers will, will tell you they're struggling to figure out exactly how the AI works, what are the weights being assigned in this neural network. And I think the psychology of that is probably, you know, it's, it almost takes you back to a pre-enlightenment model where you say, why does the sun come up? Because there's a sun god. You know, in other words, you have some pre-rational explanation for it. Well, why are we doing, why are we following this path? Well, because the black box uh, tells us we have to do it. You know, you go into a doctor and the doctor says, the machine says you have cancer. And you say, well, you can you see it on the, on the, uh, on the uh, x-ray? No. But the machine said, the machine has looked at 100 million cases and has found something in there. And based on previous history, we know that the machine is going to be right. But we don't know why. Right? That's, a, that's a kind of unnerving thought. Yeah, and I think this is going to be one of the big challenges of our age is that much more is going to be dependent on trust. We're going to actually turn to these machines and they're going to speak our language just as fluently as you or I sitting here at this very moment and trying to understand what's behind that. Like, why is it saying those things is something that we AI developers haven't yet really got our heads around. It's, uh, it's, it's still beyond reach, a big research area. What, what, do you, what do you think about that first question about how do you handle, uh, I assume you agree with that the disruptive potential of AI in, in employment is, it, it, you know, do you, do you, how do you think about that? I mean, look, my take is that the disruption is inevitable and the key question for our decade is one of redistribution. And we have to face the fact that labor and the value that labor produces is going to be converted into capital. And that capital in the past has been manifested in commodities, raw physical atoms that we move around in the universe. And in the future, it's going to be manifested in bits yep. and intellectual capital, you know, AI. 
And that, that really raises the question of sort of how do we redistribute the benefits of that over the longer term? I think this is talking 10 or 20 or 30 years out. Yeah. Um, and we have to just get a lot more comfortable with that concept. I mean, from a kind of European perspective, it's more familiar to talk about the centrality of the nation state being you know, the, the source of redistribution. But I think we're going to have to get very comfortable with that the world over. Yeah. There's a great question here from YouTube, um, and uh, the person asks, what is the biggest challenge facing journalists as we head into the upcoming election? Oh, God. <laughs> where, does one, where does one start? Um, well, journalism, first of all, has a structural challenge uh, relating to all of this, which is, um, the, the, you know, if you thought the model had been disrupted enough by, by Google and Facebook and, and all of that, it's now going to get disrupted by, by AI um, in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and so there's that big structural challenge, which, uh, you know, uh, how do you handle? What, what do you do about it? AI trains on, on a lot of data produced by journalists, but then, or by, by journalists, by writers, by historians, by experts, but then is able to mimic that, that stuff. And, you know, how do you, so I think there's a kind of meta challenge there that, that is very deep and profound. The, the way it manifests in this election uh, is twofold. One, there is the familiar problem we now have, uh, which is what to do about you know, one candidate who's just going to lie. And it, what do you do most importantly about the fact that the people who support him most ardently don't care that he's lying? That's actually a much bigger challenge, because it's not that difficult to point out he's lying. The problem is you feel like a broken record having no consequence when it makes no difference. Remember, at this point, by most polls, a third of the American voting public, that's about 85 million adults in America, believe the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. Right? So the problem isn't that Trump says it. The problem is 85 million Americans believe it. And so what do you do? I mean, 50 states, more, a majority of them Republicans certified that election. 60 court cases dismissed all charges of fraud. But those are just facts, and you can keep saying them, and it doesn't change. And so part of our challenge is not technological at all. It is that there is within this country this deep sense of disaffection and distrust. You know, it gets back to your, your, your point about trust. Uh, that means they don't trust the institutions. They don't trust you know, anything about the system. That burn the house down mentality makes it very difficult to engage in a normal democratic in normal democratic politics because at some level there is some, you know, shared uh, understanding of facts and norms and procedures, but none of these people have that. And you know, if you ask me why is it, I I don't even know that I'm completely confident that they actually believe the 2020 election was 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 uh, was you know fraudulent. I think it's their way of saying F you. It's their way of saying, we simply are not going to play your game. We're not going to buy into your narrative. We're not going to you know, be, up, be ups, upset at the things you want us to be upset about. And that is the, the challenge. How do you, how do you, in, you know, look, I think of journalism as public education. How do you do that with, some, with somebody who says, I don't want to be educated? You know, and, and so that's the bigger challenge. The technological piece, Look, we, you know, the AI is going to proliferate all these deep fakes and all of that stuff. And it's, I mean, the subtle versions are the things I worry more about. When you see Joe Biden saying something that, you know, he obviously didn't say, maybe there's, there'll be reporting around it. But the things I worry about is so, for instance, the Republican response to one of Biden's, uh, I think it was not this one, but the last State of the Union, um, was, you know, a, a kind of, there was a video which was about the picture of, rampant crime and lawlessness and, and, you know, street burnings. And it all looked very grim. It turned out it was all AI. It was those who are not, and I mean, they could have, if they looked hard enough, they probably could have found <laughs> enough image. But it was much more vivid because the whole thing was computer generated. And it looked like they were, you know, they didn't say at any point we are, you know, what, the images you are seeing are real images from America. But that was the implication, right? And they were all made up. 
And here's the, the fascinating problem with the way we, uh, we process uh, information. So somebody told me about a, uh, an experiment they ran where they showed a bunch of people, a focus group, uh, a videotape of a f prominent politician. I, I won't mention the name because you'll see why. Uh, having sex, uh, you know, some kind of adulterous sex or something like that. Then they tell the people that this was a deep fake, that this was a fake video. And then a few minutes later, they ask them, what is your opinion of the person? Oh, and they'd ask them, what is your opinion of the person? There's a 30% drop in the favorability rating, even after you tell them that this was a fake. Because at some level, you know, you, you trust your eyes. You say, well, I, I just saw something, and it leaves me uneasy. We talked a little bit about the um, challenges facing Republicans and, and Trump and so on. Do you, do you want to say, this is a question from YouTube, um, what are the biggest challenges facing the Democrats at the upcoming election? Um, I think the biggest challenge for the Democrats and for Biden in particular is he isn't playing well on this cultural field. He's playing very well on the economic field. I mean, Biden has frankly done an extraordinarily good and competent job in managing the economy. We have come out of the... COVID, uh, you know, a recession or whatever you want to call it, much better than uh, any other major economy in the world. The U.S. is, you know, is the statistics are actually almost stunning. We have uh, unemployment at the lowest it's been in 50 years. Uh, inflation is now down to about 3%. Uh, if you look at some of the historical indices that would tell, you know, there, there is something really quite remarkable happening. Black participation in the labor force is now slightly higher than white participation in the labor force. That has never happened before. Um, inequality has gone down for like the, for the last four or five years running. So there's a lot of stuff that, that is going. Manufacturing is up. Manufacturing employment is up. All these things. Uh, I mean, I can tell my, my favorite way of, of making this point is uh, if the UK, where you, you, you spend much of your life, uh, Mustafa, if the UK were to join the United States as the 51st state on a per capita income basis, it would be 51st. <laughs> wow. It would be below Mississippi. Yeah. Wow. You, you can look this up. Wow. Mississippi is about 47,000. Um, <laughs> uh, it is 46,000. Incredible. Um, so we're doing just fine economically, but unfortunately, that's not what this election seems like it's being played on. It's being played on immigration, on which Biden is playing defense, on the whole woke multicultural agenda on which Biden is playing defense. You know, the, it, the, on abortion, the Democrats have a, huge, a big advantage, I believe. But on all these other issues, I, my own view is Biden needs to be much, much more symbolically uh, tough on, on, on immigration, by which I mean this, you know, largely a, a kind of a, this is a, this is a kind of show of force, a show of, are you willing to deal with the chaos of the border? Because the truth is, the Republicans are not giving him the tools he needs to actually make the structural changes. But you got to deal with that. You are president. And so I would declare a national emergency, go down, send the National Guard to the border, say you're not going to shut it down. Maybe the courts will overrule half of it, maybe all of it. But Bill Clinton once had a great line in politics. He said, the American people don't always care whether you succeed, but they want to catch you trying. <laughs> you know, and there's a sense in which Biden is not trying hard enough. I think he should do a sister soldier like speech on the whole multiculturalism thing and, and make, a, you know, make the case we've gone too, down, too far down this rabbit hole of slicing and dicing people on the basis of sex and race and color of skin and ethnic, which, by the way, I happen to believe. I think, you know, we've gotten to a point where it's just, it's all came out of a good place, but it's gotten too far. You know, I mean, the, at this point, you know, the one thing I know is when I'm going to see my, the next Hamlet I see, Hamlet will not be a white man. <laughs> That's one thing I can be sure. Like, for, you know, and, and like we need to kind of move beyond that. We need to, you know, the, we've got to remember the goal of all these DEI bureaucracies is to eliminate the DEI bureaucracies. Like that has to be the goal. Like we want to be in a colorblind society. And we're not there yet and we need the work. But I think the Democrats need to be able to express some of that in a way that is 
that I think is commonsensical and makes people feel like, yeah, they, 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 you know, they see some of, I, I'm seeing a lot of this craziness in my world and why aren't these guys talking about it? And that I think the Democrats play at a disadvantage on that. I'll just take one more question that's related to this from the audience, which um, is how did the Republicans convince blue collar workers that it was actually their party and what should Biden do to fight back? Well, it's the same thing, which is there was a wonderful book called What's the Matter with Kansas, which was basically making the case all these people are voting against their economic interests. But I would argue that, you know, it's slightly patronizing to think that they're like being, being they're, they're misguided. And if only they knew, because my guess is that almost everybody in this room is voting against his or her economic interests and have been doing that for a while. You are consistently voting for the party that is gonna tax you more, um, right? And if you were simply maximizing your economic advantage, you wouldn't be doing that. But you, are, you have many identities, you have many values, and you know, some, are, some outweigh that simple crass calculation. So do, the, do, you know, do working class people the honor of recognizing the same may be true for them? Fareed, this has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for spending time with us, and congratulations on an amazing book. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.